Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Master's Saturday. Um, I am Will Nguyen and this is Eric Hyatt and we are chairs of session two, modeling in many forms. I guess we can get started today. Each talk should be about 15 minutes in length at two minutes left. One of us will indicate that the time is ending. The audience is welcome to type in questions in the chat or in the QA box in the control panel and we will bring them up after the talk. If we don't have time for questions today, we recommend that the speaker save the length of the session and be available during the break to field any unanswered questions. Students will need to vote on the best talk. A Qualtrics site has been set up for this and you can find the link on the Master Saturday website. Please vote for the best talk after the session is over. Our first speaker today is Helena Rose Tiedman and I would like to invite their mentor, Dr. Foss, to please introduce them. Dr. Foss. Hey everyone, I am thrilled and excited to uh, introduce Helena today. She has been doing excellent work the last year and modeling in a crisis. She jumped right in this project about a year ago to help us understand uh, what is the impact of spatiotemporal demand changes on the water network and how does that impact end user uh, provision of services for uh, wa our water infrastructure. Uh, she was able to, through her skills that she developed through this program, she was able to easily adapt and jump right into a project in the middle of a crisis, in the middle of a pandemic, and overcame many barriers, which you're going to hear about today. I am thrilled to say that she's going to be staying on at UT to pursue her PhD uh, along the same line of disaster management and the water sector infrastructure provision of services. So without further ado, I'm going to... Uh, introduce, uh, we're going to bring Helena up to jump in and do her presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. The title of my talk today is Modeling in a Crisis, Overcoming the Water Sector's Data Struggles to Realize the Potential of Hydraulic Pumps. So broadly speaking, infrastructure systems, whether water, transportation, energy, and so forth, are all designed to operate and provide service under a specific set of conditions. As researchers who study these systems, we often want to know what happens to them when changes occur in the communities they serve. And beyond that, how can we make our infrastructure systems more resilient to these kinds of changes? Well, the COVID-19 pandemic provides a very relevant example of a change in operating conditions for many of our infrastructure systems. Uh, looking specifically at water systems, widely enacted social distancing policies led to spatiotemporal changes in water demand meaning that as people, like all of us here today, started spending less time in our offices, schools, and other places of business, and spending more time at home, our water demands came home with us. And these changes in demand can impact system performance. Um, of particular concern is increased stagnation in areas with lower occupancy, because the disinfectants that are added to the water supply decay over time and stagnation can lead to the growth of harmful microorganisms like Legionella, the bacteria that causes Legionnaire's disease. There have been notable deadly outbreaks of this disease in Flint, Michigan, and very recently in New Jersey, for example. So it's a real concern and has serious public health implications. So how can we study these potential negative impacts and become better prepared to respond to them in, quickly in the middle of a crisis? Well, hydraulic modeling provides a fast and cost-effective way to do this if we have a model already developed. And this is because we can quickly simulate changing conditions as well as different management responses. We can also use models to identify areas of the system that are most vulnerable to some of these negative impacts. However, a key part of modeling that is often overlooked is just the vast amount of data needed to make an accurate model of a real world system. Um, there's no shortage of textbooks, industry guides, software manuals that provide instruction for how to build a model. But all of these resources assume that the modeler has all the required data in the correct format already. In practice, as I found, uh, this is rarely ever the case. And these data needs are especially problematic because the water sector lags behind other industries like transportation or energy when it comes to data management, integration, and analytics. More data now is being collected than in the past, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's well organized or put to use even. Um, in fact, a recent Water Research Foundation study found that only 10% of data 
collected by water utilities was analyzed and used. On top of these data needs, it's also often assumed that water utilities have um, hydraulic models already, and this is actually not the case. Having a developed and well-calibrated hydraulic model for use is often a privilege for only the wealthiest urban utilities. So with this in mind, shortly after the start of the pandemic, I began work on a hydraulic model using the campus of a large public university as a study area. As a closed distribution system that is independently managed by the university's utilities, this serves as a useful proxy for a full city water distribution system. And with the overarching goal of addressing some of these existing barriers that I just mentioned, there are three main research objectives of the study. First is to document the data collection and processing stages and outline the data needs in a way that could be beneficial to future users. Second is to identify the associated challenges and success factors of building a hydraulic model. And third is to demonstrate its relevance in a protracted crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic and show how the completed model could help management respond. Before discussing each research objective further, it's helpful to look at some of the existing literature on data and resiliency in the water sector. This is not a holistic list, just a selected sample to illustrate some of the dominant so several researchers have looked at the ongoing trends in data-driven management and have reviewed the progress made both in water data and hydraulic modeling and identified some of the remaining challenges like the lack of data standardization. Others have also contributed solutions and improvements to address these challenges, for example, by recommending ways to improve the use of data analytics or by developing new classification systems in their field. At the same time, there's a growing body of work that looks at resiliency of water infrastructure systems to various kinds of disruption, like extreme events or pandemics from many different angles. And a lot of this research on resiliency emphasizes the role that improvements in data management, analytics, and modeling can play in increasing resiliency. So researchers have used hydraulic modeling to study the impacts of different kinds of changes in operating conditions like shrinking populations or changes in policy leading to greater water conservation. But there's still a gap in terms of classifying the data actually needed to build a hydraulic model, as well as applying a model during a crisis management scenario. So this work aims to fill this gap by focusing specifically on hydraulic modeling data needs and demonstrating how a model could be useful in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Turning now to the first research objective, this figure illustrates the entire modeling process from data collection to analysis. While there's a lot of information here and we won't be able to cover each component, I'd like to highlight a few key takeaways. First, to construct the model, we ultimately collected 13 data sets from 10 unique sources. This collection process involved coordinating with different contexts and utilities, not only to obtain the data, but also to gain an understanding of how the system actually operates information that was often not conveyed in just the hard numbers. We classify much of this as institutional knowledge, and very importantly, it's vulnerable to being lost if it's not reported. In the water sector in particular, there's a lot of concern about the workforce approaching retirement and what will happen to their detailed knowledge of the system when they leave. I saw firsthand how valuable that knowledge is while trying to build this model. Next, uh, three broad categories of data processing were required. Analyzing the inputs and outputs on a system level scale, preparing the physical infrastructure data that was used to build the actual model, and preparing the data that would later be used in the calibration and analysis. And finally, the model was built in a commercial modeling software program, and the calibration and analysis were done using the open source Python package Winter. As shown in the schedule, the actual modeling task, which is what most instructional literature focuses on, really only accounted for a small portion of the overall process. Turning to the second research objective, several challenges were encountered which reflect many of the broader data-related problems identified in the literature. In particular, the lack of centralized data collection and integration was an issue, as this can lead to many different formats and extensive processing. Ultimately, all of these challenges together combined to create the most significant difficulty, which is the amount of time required. 
This means that it would be nearly impossible with the current state of data in the water sector for a utility to construct a model for use during an ongoing crisis. We began this process to provide a tool that could be used in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. By the time the model was completed, uh, the window of opportunity where it would have been the most useful had already passed. There were also several factors that were advantages and contributed to the successful completion of this model. In particular, working in an academic utility partnership and having access to GIS-based modeling software were key advantages. However, it's important to note that these advantages are not necessarily reflective of the entire water industry. For a resource-constrained water utility, access to software and personnel would likely be significant barriers instead. And turning now to the last research objective, a hydraulic analysis was performed with a completed model. The model was first calibrated using pressure data from five sensors located throughout the study area. Two hypothetical demand scenarios were then simulated. The base demand scenario in blue represents a typical 24-hour demand period before the pandemic. The low demand scenario in orange is a 50% overall reduction and was generated to represent the approximate decrease in demand across the entire campus due to the implementation of social distancing. It's important to note that this demonstration is just a small subset of the types of analyses that could be performed with this model. I selected three performance indicators, uh, pressure, flow velocity, and water age, to assess the impact of the demand changes. Given the time constraints, I'm going to focus primarily on the pressure and water age results today. So if we look at the time series of pressures at five specific points in the system, we can see that pressures increased in the low demand scenario compared to the base case especially during the peak demand period between hour 12 and hour 15. If we zoom in on one of these points in the central region of the system, we can see this more clearly and observe that the pressure results reflect the demand patterns of the two scenarios. Now this figure shows the distribution of the change in pressure from the base case scenario to the low demand scenario across all nodes in the system with the median line shown in red. We can see that the pressure increased at every node because the changes are all positive, but the difference was highest between the hours of 12 and 15 when the gap between the two demand curves was greatest. While these differences are noticeable, the overall average pressure across the entire system only increased by about 4.2%, showing that in terms of pressure, the system was fairly resilient actually to reductions in demand. Looking now at the water age results, this tells us about stagnation in the and we can see from the two distributions that the age in the system did increase in the low demand scenario, with the overall average age increasing about 40%. Another interesting result is the travel time for the source water. The median age shown in red increases pretty much linearly in the base case scenario until about hour 14. And this is the time it takes for water from the source to reach all nodes in the system. In the low demand scenario, this peak does not occur until hour 22 meaning the system-wide travel time increased by about eight hours. And this type of information could be useful to utility managers by helping them know, first of all, is the water age in the system reaching dangerously high levels? And second, where exactly are the potential problem areas where they may want to increase flushing and monitoring? So to conclude, in this study, we documented the data needs and processing stages for building a hydraulic model identified the key associated challenges and success factors, and demonstrated how such a model could be used in response to a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. This is just one example of how modeling could help utilities efficiently direct resources and make operational changes. However, given the data and time constraints encountered, it's clear for, that for a model to be useful in a scenario like this, it has to be developed, calibrated, and ready for use before a crisis. With that, to improve resiliency and preparedness, we recommend that utilities incorporate hydraulic modeling into their emergency response plans. But future infrastructure policy absolutely needs to support them in this endeavor. In terms of future work, I'm also happy to note that I'll be continuing this work for my PhD. And finally, I would like to sincerely thank my graduate committee, the entire project team, and all of our utility partners. Thank you all for attending, and I'm happy to take any questions. Fantastic job, Hama. Huh? Uh, I think we're, I don't see any questions right now, and I think we're out of time. Um, 
Yeah, great job. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm going to introduce the next speaker. I uh, just want to remind everybody the talks are 15 minutes each. I'm going to come on if, uh, when there's one minute left to let you know. Uh, any questions we may have can be put in the question and answer box. Uh, and I'd like to remind the audience that don't forget to go vote for best talk uh, at the on the website for Master Saturday. And so our next speaker is going to be Mayan Chen, and we're going to have her uh, advisor, Dr. Bridget Scanlon, uh, introduce her. So if you all could take it away. I think Dr. Scanlon, I think I'm introducing Mayan. Is that right, Mayan? Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. Um, yeah, Dr. Oh. Hukla will introduce me. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, well, it is my it is my great pleasure on behalf of Dr. Scanlon to introduce Mayan. She came to the EER program from Tongji University in Shanghai with a degree in geology. From 200, uh, 2020 to the present, she has interned with RBAC and Energy Consultancy here in, Tus in Houston in Austin, um, and today she will present the results of her research which combine GIS and optimization modeling to determine optimal pathways for electrification in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her supervisor is Bridget Scanlon at the BEG. Uh, Mark Helper from the Department of Geological Sciences is on our committee, as is Dr. Ben Leibowitz uh, in operations research in the Cockrell School of Engineering. So, Mayan. Thank you, Richard, for your kind introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Mei Yan Chen, and I'm happy to present my that is titled Optimal Electrification Pathways in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'll be following this outline. First, the statement of the problem, and then I'll give a brief overview of electrification in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll talk about the data and methodology I used, followed by results and discussion. Finally, the conclusions. So as we all know, um, electricity is essential to people's life quality and a country's economic development. However, in the world, there are many uh, people still live without electricity. As of 2018, there are 800 million people live without electricity, and most of them live in Sub-Saharan Africa, as we can see from this map. United Nations has set the goal for 2030 to ensure universal access to electricity with a focus on renewable energy. However, to electrify the population in Sub-Saharan Africa, the challenge is significant because Africa is the uh, area with the fastest population growth. So a good planning is important. So the objectives of my research are demonstrate the historical and current electrification in Sub-Saharan Africa and analyze the factors that influence electrification planning. And I'll develop an optimal solution for some SSA countries. And finally, I'll add some considerations regarding energy policies and, sorry, and emissions. So let's first look at the historical electrification. Um, this is showing the um, population without electricity and the share of population without electricity in the world. So we can see that the uh, electrification has been increasing in the world. But when we look at the Sub-Saharan Africa, the uh, population, the share of population without electricity access is decreasing, which is good, but the population without electricity is still increasing a little bit. <clears throat> so this is saying that the population growth has outpaced the electrification progress. And when we look at the electrification rate in 2018, uh, geographically, we can see the um, in this continent, South Africa and North Africa, and some countries in the uh, on the west coast are almost fully electrified, but many countries in the middle are poorly electrified. So when we do the electrification planning, we have to look on the country level because every country has a different situation and different energy policies. <clears throat> well, let's take a closer look at some of the countries. These countries are from different parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, generally the electrification rates are increasing. And Kenya has been making great progress over the uh, past 20 years because first it has a strong government leadership and made good planning and policies. And also because they are developing a lot of geothermal resources. And we also know that electrification rates vary from urban to rural areas. In urban areas, these countries all has a relatively high electrification rate, 
But when we look at the rural areas, we can see the huge gap between urban and rural areas. So to electrify these rural areas, which are far from the main grid, and the populations are sparsely distributed, um, maybe the grid connection is not a good, the most cost-effective choice for these areas. And as the technology of off-grid systems like mini-grid and standalone uh, develops, it might be a more cost-effective choice for the rural areas. So my research is to determine which areas is better and more suitable for um, an off-grid system. And let's also look at the power generation mix and the energy resources. So I put all these uh, transmission lines, power plants, and power generation in one map. And I use the same color for the same energy sources. Green for oil, natural gas is red, and dark gray is for coal. And the pie charts in each country is showing the power generation mix in 2017. Um, so we can see that on the East Coast, in East Coast and West Coast, um, the oil is the dominant energy source, which is rare in the rest of the world. And in the Gulf of Guinea, like Nigeria, the natural gas is the dominant. And South Africa has a lot of coal, and it, the coal is the dominant energy source there, although they are trying to replace coal with wind and solar. And except South Africa, the rest of Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa is dominant by hydro. Uh, which accounts for around half of the total energy gener power generation. Um, yeah, and um, Kenya, as I mentioned, has a lot of uh, geothermal. It develops um, recent years, but it has a hist long history of using geothermal because of the Great Rift Valley there. So what do we need to consider for the future electrification planning? We have to consider historical and current situation like population, electrification, and GDP, and also the infrastructure like power plants and transmission lines. And we also want to know how much electricity is needed for the future. So we need to know the demand, and we want to know the supply as well. So we want to know the energy resources and fossil fuel prices, and also planned transmission lines and roads. And in my research, I also want to consider energy policies and energy security. Uh, for example, hydro is vulnerable to climate change. So there are some existing models that do this optimization and planning, and some focus on renewable energy and some focus on the off-grid systems. And onset is a model that uh, do both. And this is a general framework. The onset is an open source GIS-based tool developed by KTH um, to identify the list cost option between these several seven options under three categories the grid connection mini grid solar mini grid wind mini grid diesel small hydro and standalone solar and diesel so first it calculates electricity demand using population and tier of electricity demand and to meet this demand it calculates the lcoes of the seven different technologies in each settlement so LCOE is a levelized cost of electricity and it's a long-term average of generating cost. Um, so it has three components, the investment, the operation and maintenance and fuel costs for fossil fuels. So it's a discounted um, cash flow and we can see the discount factor here. So by comparing the LCOE, it gives an optimal split, which is in the form of a map. So these are some data sets I used for this model. Uh, these are all publicly available data, and I mainly want to show the year and the resolution here of the data. So the first step of this model is to generate population cluster using these three layers. So uh, we want to know where there are, there are people living and how much of them have been electrified. So this is a QGIS plugin written in Python, and the output is a, a layer with like 50,000 uh, rows and uh, showing the information of population and electrified population, which is based on the visible nighttime lights. And this is an input for the next step, which is another plugin, and it combines all these layers into one data table. And rows and travel times are for diesel cost calculation. And mini hydro is also calculated by KTH using river network discharge flow and elevation. 
and wind and solar and valuations are for wind and solar uh, cost calculation and the grid and the level land cover are for grid connection calculation. So certain land cover types will give some penalty to the grid connection, which are not suitable for this option. So the output of this step is a data table that uh, for one country and uh, with all the settlements and uh, yeah, these um, parameters. And there are some other parameters that we can set up in the model and uh, run the Python code. So this is an example of Senegal and it gives a projection for 2025 and 2030. So the optimal splits here um, mainly are by four options. And from 2025 to 2030, the electrification rate increased to 100%. And we can see the uh, some mini grid and standalone spots have been ultimately uh, connected to the grid based on the model. And these areas in the East Senegal are far from the grid. So standalone are the best option for them. And we can also look at other variables in this model. Um, we can look at the new capacity in 2030 and we can see uh, in standalone uh, areas, there are the new capacities are much lower compared to the grid connection and the cost can be much higher. Uh, this is the LCOE per dollar per kilowatt hour. And we can see that in the grid connection uh, areas, the LCOE is relatively low. And we can also run different scenarios by changing the parameters of the model. So uh, I ran a scenario with 100% electrification in 2025, which is a actual policy of Senegal. And from the map, we can see it looks similar to the base case, but uh, when we look at the numbers, we can see an increase in standalone and mini grid solar. So this is a recommendation for Senegal to achieve this goal in a cost effective way. Another scenario I ran was to uh, consider renewable subsidies and a carbon co cost. So I added the generating cost diesel price and lower the solar cost. And we can uh, see the results in investment as we expected grid investment will be much lower and uh, more investment will be in solar and mini hydro options. So these are my conclusions. Around 47% of SSA is electrified and East Africa is making great progress. And hydro is a dominant power generation source in SSA and solar and wind are a small part, but they have great potential. And the country's energy source is generally related to the country's fossil fuel resources. And Senegal as an example, uh, to achieve the 100% electrification earlier, more mini grid and standalone solar systems are recommended. And to address emission costs and renewable subsidies, uh, more mini grid solar and mini grid hydro instead of grid connections are needed. So many thanks to my supervisor, Dr. Scanlon and my committee members. And thank you everyone that I met at EER and JSG. And thank you everyone for your attention. All right, great talk, Neon. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box quite yet, but if anybody has any, please type them away. Do we have to type them or can we ask? You can verbally say it, it's totally fine. You're in the, the panel, you're good. All right, yeah, I, I'm, I, I introduced Mayan, so I'll take that prerogative. Mayan, what about, what about I gather most of these mini grids would be um, solar powered. What about wind? Um, yes, actually it has a, a threshold for this uh, generation. So I also use the wind for input, but after calculating the wind cost is always higher than the solar. So they are just not recommended in the solution. But if I adjust the solar and wind yeah. threshold or cost, yeah, it can be an option. Sounds good. Okay, so I think we should move on to the next okay. talk. Um, next, the next speaker Thanks. is Bethany Reisick.
um, who will be introduced by Dr. Gale. Dr. Gale. Hi, everyone. Um, Bethany Rysak, who is from Maryland, earned her bachelor's degree in geoscience from Trinity University in 2018. She stayed in San Antonio working as a geologist at the Southwest Research Institute before coming to start her graduate degree at UT. And while at UT, she's been at the G uh, GRA at the Bureau with our FRAC group and is currently doing geomodeling with the TexNet group. And this summer, she's doing an internship with Avintiv, who are formerly in Cana uh, up in Denver. And her thesis is about development and growth of hydraulic fractures. So uh, take it away, Bethany. Well, let me share my screen. Thanks for that introduction, Julia. Uh, again, my name is Bethany Rysak, and today I'm going to be talking about the analysis of hydraulic fracture growth and segmentation with implications for the HFTS1 slant core in the Wolfcamp formation of the Midland Basin. And so to get straight to it, the goal of my project was to better understand the nature of hydraulic fracture propagation and segmentation. And to do that, my project was split into four different components. The first being the analysis of the HFTS1 hydraulic fracture data. The second, the examination of lab-generated hydraulic fractures. Third, the observation of natural hydraulic fractures in the field. And fourth, the representation of our hydraulic fractures in a fully coupled geomechanical model. And so due to the time constraints today, I'm just gonna be talking about the first part of my research, which is the analysis of the HFTS1 slant core. And so to provide a little background, the hydraulic fracture test site one, which I'm going to be referring to as HFTS1 for the remainder of this presentation, is located in the Midland Basin, off in the very northeast corner of Reagan County. And so on this figure on the right, you can see the well pad here outlined in orange, and that's about one and a half square miles. And so this, this site consists of an 11 well horizontal pad with its target intervals in the Wolf Camp A and the Wolf Camp B. And as you can see in the bottom figure, the Wolf Camp A wells are shown in blue and the Wolf Camp B wells are shown in red. And one of the most critical aspects of this project was the drilling of a core from a slant well that made close passes of two of the horizontal producers. And this is shown in the top right figure. This well is colored yellow in these two figures. And so the collected core passed at its closest 60 feet from the six U well in the Wolf Camp A and 97 feet from the uh, 6M well in the Wolf Camp B. And the goal with this core was to capture ground truth hydraulic fractures generated by these two wells. And so let's talk a little bit more about this slant core. 600 feet of core in total was collected in six big pieces. And so cores one through four up here were collected in the Wolf Camp A, which consists of several interlayered facies and cores five and six were collected in the Wolf Camp B, which is predominantly a siliceous mud facies. And so taking a closer look at the core, we note that it was recovered at an angle of about eight degrees from horizontal. And this places our bedding at a slight angle in core as seen here. And this actually provides a useful top indicator, which allows us to be able to measure more reliable fracture orientations in core. And so when we see this in the lab, it looks something like this. And in this lower figure here, the hydraulic fractures are outlined in purple. And so when this project was done, there was a little back of the envelope calculation based on the core locations and the nearby well completions. And so it was originally estimated that about 105 hydraulic fractures in total would be found in the core. However, the fracture characterization team ended up identifying 375 hydraulic fractures, which more than triples the initial estimate. And this is really where my work comes in. I want to better understand how hydraulic fractures propagate in the subsurface, but more specifically, I want to understand how we would get a greater number of fractures than those potentially initiated at the well bore. And so to answer that question, the focus of my project has been on mechanisms of fracture diversion and fracture segmentation. And I'm going to focus on three specific features within these. The first being diversion steps, and these occur when a hydraulic fracture diverts along a plane of weakness for distance and then may or may not reorient or kink after a time and continue to propagate. And these planes of weakness can be bedding, natural fractures, or concretions. My second feature of interest was twist hackles, and these represent a breakdown at the fracture tip and result in the creation of an echelon arrays of fractures. And my third feature is bifurcation, which is most simply the branching of a fracture into two or more fractures. 
And so starting off with our first feature, diversion steps, we can observe that they come in several different flavors in the core. They can take the form of a planar step over feature crossing the core face, like we can see here on the left, or they can take on more irregular arrangements, such as a ramp step shown in the middle, or several steps emanating from a central axis as seen here on the right. In total, 99 fractures were found to have evidence of diversion. And we, may, we mainly saw these diversions in relation to lithology and natural fractures. Overall, 57% of our diversion step group interacted with lithology. And this is pretty unsurprising as we know the wolf camp to be highly mechanically layered. This type of diversion usually takes the form of the hydraulic fracture propagating along until it encounters an unstable bed boundary at which it reorients and steps over for a certain distance before then reorienting again and continuing to propagate in an orientation similar to the original. Following close behind, we saw that 38% of our diversion step population resulted from natural fracture interaction. And this interaction can take two forms, with the first being hydraulic reactivation. And so in this figure at the bottom left, we have a natural fracture shown in yellow and a hydraulic fracture shown in red. From this interaction, we propose that the hydraulic fracture propagated from west to east, encountered the natural fracture, and then split in two with one side reactivating the northeast side of the natural fracture and the other continuing to propagate along the initial orientation. Some other instances where hydraulic and natural fractures were captured together resulted in a slight jog along the fracture face. And a nice example of this can be seen on the figure to the right. And so here we're looking down on the fracture face and we can see this white natural fracture crossing right across the middle. We can detect a slight change in the surface elevation as the fracture comes along hits the natural fracture, steps up slightly without reactivating the natural fracture before reorienting and then continuing to propagate. And so now let's take a look at the distribution of these features in core. And this is a schematic figure showing the six pieces of the slant core. The lines crossing the core cylinders are gonna represent the location of the diversion steps and the colors of these lines are going to indicate whether it's hydraulic or if it involves a natural fracture. And so in the core, we can see that diversion steps are much more prolific in the Wolf Camp A cores one through four than they are in the Wolf Camp B cores five through six. And because we've seen the large impact of natural fractures and lithology on diversion steps, this apparent difference could be due to the lesser amounts of natural fractures and mechanical bedding present in the Wolf Camp B unit. And so now moving on to twist tackles. In the slant core, we identified 67 hydraulic fractures that showed these features. We also observed that twist tackles tended to come in two types in the core, those being gradual and abrupt. In general, gradual twist tackles form within the parent joint bed and grow orthogonally from the parent joint plumose structure, and they're gonna curve up and out and increase in displacement to the bed boundary. This represents a continuous breakdown of the parent joint. And we can see a really nice example of that to the right in the core, with the plumose indicating that the fracture curved up likely towards a mechanical boundary. In total, we saw that 34% of observed twist tackles in core were gradual. Abrupt, tackle, abrupt, abrupt twist tackles are much the same idea, except they form in the beds above and below the bed containing the parent joint. And the hackles are expressed as a series of regularly spaced and echelon cracks that abut the parent joint bed at an angle different to that from the parent joint plumos. And this represents a discontinuous breakdown of the parent joint. And to the right, again, we see a nice example of this in core where we propose the fracture propagated from below, encountered the change in lithology, and then segmented into N echelon fractures. Overall, we saw that 54% of twist tackles in the core were abrupt. And so because twist tackles are so closely dictated by the nature of the lithology in the presence of bed boundaries, they often show a clustered nature in their appearance and core, with more located in specific areas of increased mechanical heterogeneity. This correlation with stratigraphy is something I'm currently investigating with the help of the geo model I've been building for part four of my project. And so last but not least, moving on to bifurcations. In the simplest terms, a bifurcation is the branching of a fracture into two or more fractures. And in this schematic here, we can see the parent fracture propagating along until it reaches this line of divergence at which it splits into two, creating fracture A, shown in red, and fracture B, shown in green. 
And the, ori the orientation between these two is going to be our direction of bifurcation, which is shown here with the yellow line. Overall, we identified 22 of these bifurcation doublets, also known as pairs, in the slant core. Oftentimes in core, though, we cannot always capture the line of divergence. But based on the orientations of the fractures, we can trace it to just outside the core margin, as we can see with these examples here. And while we can arbitrarily determine propagation direction offhand just by looking at certain bifurcation doublets, I was able to obtain more quantitative data on bifurcation direction using the collected fracture orientation data from the fracture description, and also by doing some stereo net gymnastics. And through this process, I was able to determine the bifurcation direction for our 22 doublets. This stereo net here to the left has points indicating the lines of bifurcation for each doublet pair. These data show that in the Wolf Camp A, a majority of our doublets indicate fracture propagation to the west, and in the Wolf Camp B, a majority of doublets indicate propagation to the east. Thinking about the completions done at the well pad, this is actually about what we would expect to see in core. And now let's see how these 22 doublets are distributed in the core. And in reality, the number of doublets is likely much larger than 22, but their points of bifurcation or their lines of diversion are just too far outside the core margin for us to be able to tell for sure. For those we can identify, we see that doublets occur at about a rate of 0.04 per foot in the Wolf Camp A, and only about half that in the Wolf Camp B. And while we cannot say for sure why we see these changes in rate of appearance, it is potentially linked to the lithology differences we've been observing between the Wolf Camp A and the Wolf Camp B. And so wrapping up what we've seen in core, we found that more fractures were found in the core than were initially expected. And to explain that, we turned to fracture segmentation and diversion as mechanisms for increasing the density of our fracture network. We saw that 44% of all hydraulic fractures show some sort of segmentation or diversion feature. And that's a pretty substantial chunk of our hydraulic fracture population. Diving into that 44%, we found that mechanical heterogeneity like natural fractures or interlayering of different lithologies seemed to play the biggest role in the initiation of these features and the creation of a dense, closely spaced fracture network. And this slide sums up the findings from the other aspects of my project. When looking at diversion and segmentation fe features elsewhere, we saw the importance of natural fractures in the lab and bedding and pre-existing deformation in the field. We were also able to calculate the increased surface area provided by these features, and we were able to incorporate our HFTS1 fractures into a geo model and compare their locations to reservoir properties. And so to bring it all together, we've now identified segmentation and diversion features in the core, in the lab and in the field. And this indicates that these complex types of fracture propagation are likely a lot more common than we initially assumed, and that they likely play a larger role in the overall formation of a fracture network. And our ongoing work is focusing on trying to generate these features in the 3D model space, which could potentially aid in the development of more accurate 3D fracture modeling in the future. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much for listening and I'll go ahead and take any questions. Fantastic talk, Bethany. Uh, we actually have one question from Dr. Flemings. Okay. Uh, he, he said, why is hydraulic fracture diverted at lithologic boundary? Is it because of stress or is it is different in the lithology it encounters or is it the lithology it encounters more or less in, indurated? Is it because of stress is different? Oh, that's a really good question. And I really think it depends a lot of times at what kind of lithologic boundary it is, depending on if it's between two shales. And oftentimes we see pyrite layers in the wolf camp as well. And what I usually assumed was that um, the stress is different. And I think it's because the contacts sometimes are planes of weakness, which will attract the fracture tip. Um, the thinking about it as indurated is something I haven't really thought about too much, but- um, Can you define indurated for us that don't do this? Yeah, that would actually be a little bit helpful for me as well. Peter, can you lend anything to that as well? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh oh, I just meant better cemented, harder, stronger cohesion, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think that has a lot to do with the nature of the contact because with the pyrite, I think there's a lot it's a lot more cohesive and it's a much stronger bed compared to those surrounding it. And there also is a lot of uh, cementation seen in the Wolf Camp as well with all the natural fractures. And so sometimes 
yeah, depending on what lithologies you have, you're going to have different cohesion along the bed boundaries to attract that fracture tip. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, I, I learned quite a bit there. Um, but we're going to have to move on just a little bit. Okay. Um, so our next speaker is going to be uh, David Wiggs. I'd like to remind everybody that if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. And please get, head on to the Master Saturday site to vote for your favorite talk. So without any ado, uh, Dr. Flemings, could you uh, introduce uh, Wiggs for us? Thank you. Uh, we all call him Wiggs, not David. I don't know why. Uh, David has received his uh, BS in geophysics at uh, Austin in 2019, and he stayed on for a master's degree. He has uh, developed a model to describe how the velocity of a mud rock evolves as a mud rock is buried uh, and deformed in, in complex ways. Um, his work has the potential to improve seismic imaging, uh, as well as enable us to predict pressure and stress from seismic data. And it's at the interface of seismology, geology, and geotechnical engineering. And because of that, David's had, had three very active advisors with Maria Nicolanacu and Kyle Spikes, uh, both uh, playing a huge role in this. And I would add that David's taught me a huge amount along the way, and that's the best part uh, of being an advisor. Uh, David will start uh, at a full-time position at EOG in San Antonio uh, this summer. Take it away, David. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. Thank you for that great introduction, Peter. But first, hey, everybody, thank you for being here. The title of my presentation today is a generalized model to estimate the elastic stiffness tensor of mud rocks based on the full strain tensor. And as Peter mentioned, my name is David Wiggs. And I also really want to give a thank you to my advisor, Peter, and my committee, Kyle Spikes and Maria, for all their help throughout this process. And then so to start, I really want to give everybody a basic definition of seismic anisotropy because it is a critical concept in my work. So seismic anisotropy at its most basic definition is a directional dependence of the velocity of seismic waves within the earth. So this means that the anisotropy arises from aligned heterogeneities that are at scales smaller than the scale of measurement. So a great way to think about anisotropy is to compare our horizontal and vertical elastic stiffnesses or the velocity squared times density. So the four elastic stiffnesses to compare are C11, the horizontal compressional elastic stiffness, C66, the horizontal shear stiffness, C33, the vertical compressional stiffness, and C44, the vertical shear stiffness. And so there's several types of anisotropy to consider that include stress-induced, layer-induced, but then the focus of our talk today is gonna to be grain orientation-induced anisotropy. And so grain orientation-induced anisotropy arises from alignment of platy clay grains. So if we think about the box we have here, upon deposition, these platy clay grains are randomly aligned. This leads to an isotropic medium where both the horizontal and vertical elastic stiffnesses are the same. But then as we compact that medium, the grains collapse and align perpendicular to the direction of compaction. And this leads to an increase in the elastic stiffnesses perpendicular to the direction of compaction, or in this case, the horizontal. And so with that, I wanna be able to discuss the importance of the elastic stiffness prediction of mud rocks. So ultimately our model provides the ability to be able to predict the elastic stiffnesses and seismic anisotropy of a mud rock due to any strain case. This means that if we have the full strain tensor and constituent fractions along with their properties, we can predict the elastic stiffness and anisotropy of that mud rock. And so this method is gonna be useful because first, we can combine it with a poor mechanical model to understand the impact of complex deformation on mud rock elastic properties. And then second, we can take inverted elastic stiffnesses that are output from a seismic inversion and predict the deformation that's undergone by mud rock and field data and then finally, we can improve upon conventional seismic processing techniques by informing a tilted transverse isotropic or TTI seismic processing model to improve seismic imaging in complex strain environments. So with an understanding of the importance of our method, I now wanna look at the primary objectives of our work. So first we wanna be able to estimate the elastic stiffnesses of mud rock given any strain field. So this means that we wanna be able to for build a forward model that incorporates porosity loss and particle alignment due to deformation. So a great way to see the impact of deformation on the microstructure of mud rocks is through the examination of SEM images. So here on the right, we see two images of the resedimented Boston blue clay at different stress conditions. First, 
In the top right, we have a sample at 0.1 MPA loading with a porosity of 0.57. Within the image, you can see large black pores and randomly oriented platy clay grains. Then, as we move to the second image, we raise the loading of the sample to 10 MPA and the sample undergoes uniaxial compaction. This leads to a reduction in the porosity to 0.35 and a volumetric strain of 33%. In addition, we can see within the image that now the platy clay grains have collapsed to the horizontal, leading to a preferential alignment perpendicular to the loading direction. So we hope to incorporate this ap approach into the elastic stiffness prediction in order to improve seismic imaging and our subsurface deformation interpretation. With the objectives of our work in mind, I next want to highlight the key steps in our workflow. So the first step is going to be to compute the building block elastic stiffnesses. Our building block is going to be comprised of a domain and isolated quartz. An example of these terms can be seen in the figure on the right, where we again have that SEM image of the resediment Boston blue clay at 0.1 MPA loading. Despite the overall random orientation of platy clay grains, if we look on the local scale, such as in this red box, there's an alignment of platy clay grains and pores. This is what we term a domain. Also in the image, we can see these isolated quartz grains. Our building block is gonna consist of these two items, a domain and isolated quartz. The second step is gonna to be to generate an orientation distribution function or an ODF, which predicts the density of alignment of building blocks at every orientation based on the full strain tensor. From there, step three is to combine steps one and two to compute the mud rock elastic stiffnesses. And so step one, as I mentioned, is to compute the building block elastic stiffnesses. To create this, we're initially going to construct a 50% clay and 50% porosity effective medium, and then adjust to any porosity by replacing a portion of that effective medium with either clay or porosity. Then finally, we'll adjust to the bulk rock fractions by adding an isolated isotropic quartz. The results of the calculation of this single building block can be seen here on the right, where the x-axis is porosity and the y-axis is elastic stiffnesses. We see for the compressional elastic stiffnesses are blue as C11 and C33, and the shear stiffnesses, shear elastic stiffnesses are C66 and C44 in green. There are two key details that I wanna highlight from this plot. First, we see that as we decrease porosity, the magnitude of all of the elastic stiffnesses increase. And then second, for example, if we look at the gap between C11 and C33, we see that as we reduce porosity, more and more anisotropy is introduced. So once we have predicted the building block elastic stiffnesses, our second step was to predict their alignment due to any strain case. To do this, we use the March model to predict the final distribution of the building blocks based on the volumetric strain, the change in the length of the principal deformation axes and our initial distribution. So a great way to think about this or what this function does is to examine the prediction of building block alignment from uniaxial compaction. So the two uh, boxes in the center of the slide show a 2D cartoon of uniaxial compaction, where in uniaxial compaction, if we think about the area of the box, the original box will have a length of one to one. But as that box undergoes deformation, we'll simply keep the horizontal axes equal to one and shorten in the vertical direction. So if we look at the lines within the box, originally they are randomly oriented, but then as we move to the second cartoon, we see that after uniaxial compaction, the lines have aligned to the horizontal. So with that in mind, to properly represent the results from this Owens March function, we use a stereogram to depict the distribution. So I know that many of us have often looked at stereonets, but here, rather than looking at the Southern hemisphere, we're gonna turn it on its side. So we see that theta represents the angle between the pole to the building block and the vertical. And then psi is gonna represent the angle in and out of the page. So looking at this two stereograms on the right, the top figure represents our stereogram prior to uniaxial compaction. So we he see here that we have an equal distribution of poles at all orientations, meaning that our building blocks are randomly oriented. We then see after uniaxial compaction on the bottom, we now have a higher density of poles in darker red that are parallel to the vertical. This means that the building block orientations are gonna be parallel to the horizontal. So after we have predicted the building block elastic stiffnesses and the distribution of their orientations, we can finally combine them 
to be able to compute the mudrock elastic stiffnesses. So here in the figure, we have, we have the predicted elastic stiffnesses for a mudrock that has undergone uniaxial compaction. So this plot again has porosity decreasing along the x-axis and stiffness increasing along the y. We see that at our original porosity of 0.58, the compressional and shear elastic stiffnesses are gonna be equal to each other. And this indicates we have no anisotropy. Second, we see that as we uniaxially compact the sample, we increase the magnitude of our elastic stiffnesses with porosity reduction in the building blocks along with their alignment. In addition to that, we see that the difference between the horizontal and vertical elastic stiffnesses increase, meaning that we introduce more anisotropy. And so ultimately, this model is going to be useless unless we can validate it against experimental data. And so here, we have plotted two separate experiments of uniaxial compaction on mud rocks. In addition, I shaded 10% error for each of the elastic stiffness predictions. We see that for the cases of compressional elastic stiffnesses, C11 and C33, they match almost every point within 10% error. In the case of the shear elastic stiffnesses, we overpredict the elastic stiffnesses by greater than 10%. This could be due to the fact that the March model overpredicts the alignment of building blocks, that they actually interlock at lower strains and don't continue to rotate. And so with this workflow created, I wanna be able to examine a potential application of our work. So here we have plotted the results from a poor mechanical model of a rising salt dive here. So originally there was a flat salt layer deposited. And after that, we incrementally loaded sediment on top. Through time, salt upbuilded along this left edge, oh, sorry, along this left edge color and then coloring the plot is porosity for each element of sediment. Overlying the porosity are crosses representing the amount of strain undergone by that element of sediment. So to illustrate this, I call it the cross you see here. And so what we can see is in the original box at deposition, the axes are one-to-one -one and oriented parallel to hor the horizontal. But then as the sediment is deformed, we see a shortening of both axes along with a rotation of our principal axes. So if we come back to the cross section, I wanna be able to highlight two key areas. First, along the right edge of the image, away from salt, we can see that as we move down the sediment column, we have a large reduction in porosity from compaction and a shortening of both axes. Then if we look along the salt, the sediment in close proximity shows a higher porosity maintained at depth along with a rotation of the principal strains and shortening along one axis corresponding to extension along the other. So with the results from this poor mechanical model, so our full strain tensor and porosity, we predict for each element the resulting elastic stiffness matrix of the mudrock. So here we now have each element colored by epsilon, the compression on isotropy, and the crosses overlying represent the mag magnitude of the maximum compressional stiffnesses in blue and the minimum compressional stiffnesses in red. So if we look at the same two areas from the previous figure, we notice that two interesting relationships. First, along the right side of the image, where we saw large reductions in porosity, both elastic stiffnesses greatly increase in magnitude and very little anisotropy is introduced. Then near the salt, higher values of anisotropy are introduced with a large difference between the two compression elastic stiffnesses. So this result highlights the ability of our workflow to explore the impact of deformation on the elastic stiffnesses of mud rocks. With that, I would like to give you my conclusions. First, we model the elastic stiffness matrix and seismic anisotropy caused by deformation. Second, our workflow incorporates porosity loss and particle reorientation into the prediction of mudrock elastic stiffnesses. Third, our model results strongly match compression elastic stiffnesses and seismic anisotropy. And then finally, we determine a novel way to couple geomechanical and effective media models to examine mudrock elastic stiffness behavior due to deformation. Again, a special thank you to my advisor, Peter, my committee, Kyle Maria, and at the Jackson School in Geofluids for an incredible two years. I would now be happy for any questions. All right. Um, thanks, David, for a really good talk. We do have about a minute for a question, and we do have something from, let's see, Dr. Gale, I believe. Um, I have a question about diagenic versus mechanical processes that result in particle reorientation. Um, I think there's supposed to be a question attached to that. Dr. Gill, if you want to go live. Yeah, yeah, I was anticipating that you would let me um, come on and, and uh, just ask the question. Go so, for it. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really interesting topic and very valuable work. 
I was watching what you were doing with the um, mechanical rotation of your particles. And it yes, reminded yeah. me of some work that one of my ex-colleagues, and in fact, Peter's colleague, um, Rory Day Stewart, he did some work um, looking at um, diagenetic processes that led to the breakdown of clay particles. And his, his finding was that some of that reorientation is to do with diagenetic processes of um, dissolution and reprecipitation rather than mechanical rotation. Now, it may not make it may not make a difference in the end to your um, you know your um, calculation of the elastic stiffness tensor but I just wondered you mentioned there was a little bit of um, you were wondering if the March model had overestimated the amount of I, I don't know if that that might be an avenue to just look into to see if there would be any difference in the properties um, as a that arose for diagenetic processes versus mechanical rotation yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that definitely being able to bring in the diagenetic element and understanding how that prevents orientation or in the case of Rory, actually even leading to more could be really beneficial to be able to properly predict the alignment. Okay, and I see that um, Peter's jumped in and, and says that the uh, stresses and temperatures are not sufficient for the those processes to happen. So that's that's a really good point. And that would, you know, allow further um, you know, refinement of the analysis as to when you start to have to incorporate the diagenesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, that's great. Really good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we got to move on to the next talk. Thanks, David, again. Um, next up is Rita Al, who is co-advised co by Dr. Trugman and Dr. Gran. I believe Dr. Trugman's in the room right now. Please take it away. Yeah, so it's my pleasure to introduce Reed Ayo. Um, Reed originally came to UT in 2019, uh, actually to work on global tomography and seismic imaging with Professor Steve Grand. Um, but he rather quickly developed a keen interest in applying machine learning to earthquake seismology. And so that today he's going to present an overview of some of his work that's really focusing on understanding both the strengths and the limitations of applying machine learning approaches to the earthquake detection problem. So without further ado, take it away, Reed. Yes, thanks uh, for <clears throat> Daniel's introduction. So let me share my screen. Okay, for my master thesis project, I mainly compare two different uh, machine learning based earthquake detection algorithms. And uh, first of all, what is earthquake detection? Uh, it is uh, in fact a very fundamental problem in seismology. It is the used to estimate the time of uh, seismic phases on seismograph. And it is a fundamental of other techniques such as uh, earthquake location and tomography. And uh, this is uh, earthquake distribution in North California. However, there are several challenges in earthquake detection. First is uh, all amplitude arrivals. As we can see on the left side, if the amplitude of arrival is uh, so small, uh, the noise will have big influence on the detection result. Another issue is overlapping events. As you can imagine, if there, the events uh, happened at nearly the same location or nearly the same time, uh, the same phase time difference is much smaller. And uh, so it's very hard to discern. Another issue is the S wave performance because of uh, P coda wave. As you can see at the right side, S wave is always arrival later than P waves. And uh, after P wave arrivals, there is still vibration and there are also some noise. So it's hard uh, for S detection. 
To solve these challenges, there are some classic approaches. Uh, the first is uh, human analysis, which is conducted by experienced seismologists uh, using band pass filter and the resampling and so on. Oh, well, advantage of this method is that uh, it is with high precision, but uh, there is always man-made errors. And if the data size is very big, uh, it will increase human labor. Another automation method uh, solves this uh, problem called the STA LTA, which computes the ratio of energy in a short term window with that in a long term window and sets threshold. As you can see on this picture, using this, uh, this method, we finally detected uh, a wave, uh, a phase between the red line and the blue line. So, Advantage of this matter is that uh, we don't need the prior knowledge of uh, events view form or source view information. The disadvantage is also P code uh, is still have effect on us and uh, it is uh, sensitive to noise level. And additionally, it also needs some processing process such as a uh, band path filter. And uh, you may set different threshold for each view form. So is there any more efficient way to solve this problem to reduce the pre-processing, especially when the data is very big? Uh, machine learning is in fact a very efficient method to solve our seismology problem. In general, machine learning uses training data to build our model and then make predictions. Uh, for example, if we want to know our picture, uh, whether there is a cat or a dog, we may put the image in, through several layers and uh, extract some high-level features such as the ears uh, and the eyes and the mouth. And finally make a prediction whether this uh, is a cat or dog with the uh, probability. So earthquake detection is the same kind of same problem. We input our uh, seismic waves and then finally through different layers extract the, extract the system to find the features of this waveform. We get the probability of different phases such as the PS and the noise. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that Earthquake detection, in fact, is a supervised learning problem in machine learning, which means that uh, the input waveform are labeled. Uh, for our waveform, it is always uh, labeled with P and S wave to train our earthquake detection algorithm. So it is a supervised learning problem. But today I will introduce uh, two machine learning based method called FaceNet and AQ transformer. FaceNet algorithm is invented three years ago and the AQ transformer uh, invented just last year. So there are many two uh, new algorithms to test. The training data for these two methods are different. FaceNet uses Northern California Earthquake Data Center, which is a regional data and the EQ transformer uses Stanford Earthquake dataset, which is a global dataset. And the machine learning structure for these two methods are totally different, but the input and the output for these two algorithms are the same. Both uh, three components of seismic wave and the dis uh, probability distribution on each channel. So to test our new method, uh, we use a new data set that is a University of Utah Event Bulletin or UEB data set. This is a very good data set to test our uh, detection method. This is the event distribution within this data set. The original catalog data is a blue circle. But after human experience, human inspection, uh, we found many new faces on this catalog, which is showed in the red dot. Uh, 
they also use some other automation methods such as uh, correlation to expand the size of data. There are different uh, types of data also. As you can see that uh, in this polygon region, in fact, which is a mining region, there are quite a big uh, data set here. And uh, the other uh, red dot are just uh, normal events. Uh, additionally, uh, this data set has never been tested uh, based on these two algorithms. So we may, we may find some interesting things both for this data set and the algorithms. And the, also the data set is uh, about, uh, the waveform for this data set is about uh, five gigabit. So it is a, a, a collectible to our GSG machine and uh, make some results. So before I show you the results of my detection, I want to introduce some basic and very important classification matrix. First, say the true positive, false positive, and false negative. Uh, for our problems uh, here, the true positive is the right uh, positive detection results. Well, the first positive is the wrong detection result compared with the ground truth uh, of UEB data log. Well, the first negative is the uh, phases that is uh, detected by UEB but not found by our algorithms. And the, another two concepts is the precession and the recall in machine learning. Uh, precession computes the ratio of the true positive to the total detection results, and the recall computes the ratio of the true positive to the whole total ground truth number. And there is a nice picture to illustrate uh, this very important uh, concept. Where precession is uh, just uh, how many selected items are relevant, which is the uh, uh, half. Uh, half circle to the total circle area. And the recall is uh, how many relevant items are selected. And uh, it is, uh, uh, which means uh, half circle uh, to the total rectangular relevant uh, element area. So here I will show you some examples of uh, our results. We mainly shows the results of FaceNet P waves. This is the true positive of FaceNet detection result. And uh, you can see that the blue line is the FaceNet face, peak to face P face. And the green line is the UEB catalog P face. They both pick a clear P face on this seismograph. Well, for FaceNet false positive, we can see that uh, uh, the face picked by FaceNet is in fact not that clear or not right. And there is a still huge uh, time difference compared with the UEB catalog data, which is a very clear, comparable clear picked on this uh, seismograph. And uh, this is the false negative, which means the, uh, uh, our algorithm didn't pick any faces uh, nearby the ground truth of UEB. Here is another example of false negative, which is very interesting to show. First, that, first is that we can see that face net in fact uh, picks some faces, which is very clear. There is a sudden change. Well, for the ground truth of UEB data, data set, there are two faces picked, but uh, in fact, they, they, they are not that very clear. So we may hold a doubt that whether the UEB data are all perfect ground truth. One minute. So there is a summary uh, for face net. First is that uh, the true positive uh, they both picked a uh, great true positive, but the uh, face net is uh, 
face nets performance on us is much worse. And there are also many false positive, which uh, cause the precession not that high. And the false negative is uh, quite small compared with false positive, but uh, uh, that caused the recall much better. But compared with the original paper, the precession and the recall is still very low. Uh, but I want to mention that for this paper, they just uh, use a part of their training set to test their, their model. So we can see that, uh, in fact, uh, there is a still limitation for their method. So in summary, it's a, there is a limitation to new data set and the EQ transformer is a much better than as we've compared and the ground truth still have some man-made error. Uh, thank you. Great talk, Ray. Um, I don't see any questions, but uh, we've actually run out of time. Um, okay. So we're gonna to move on to the next talk. Uh, next talk is going to be given by uh, Jasmine Nelson, but I'd like to remind everybody to uh, put the question answers or questions in the question and answer box. And if uh, you would right after this, go ahead and go on to the, the Jackson site and vote for your favorite talk. Um, so with that, uh, Dr. Julia Clark will be given the, um, the introduction. Thank you, Eric. It's such, such a pleasure today to introduce Jasmine Nelson. She has been a true joy to have in the lab these last two years. Um, her undergraduate degree is from UT Permian Basin, and um, she's going on to great things. She's got an NSF GRFP, and she's going to do conservation bioacoustics, which might bring her into some cool machine learning. Who knows? Um, for her PhD. So with no further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jasmine Nelson and her talk on reptile hearing. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Let me get my screen fully up. Okay. So yeah, I'm really excited to present to you guys today. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, models that I developed in order to predict hearing abilities in extinct reptiles and how those kind of differ from the current models or proxies that are already in use. And so just to give you an overview of uh, the presentation today, first I'll start by talking about the uses of hearing and the different mechanisms that we use to hear or that reptiles use to hear. I'll talk a little bit about the previous models uh, that were used for predicting hearing in extinct reptiles. And then I'll go on to talk about the models that I went on to develop and implications and future work that may come out of those models. So to start, hearing is really important uh, in almost all taxa. Uh, so a lot of species will use their hearing in order to, uh, it can aid in foraging, it can help to avoid predators. If you're able to localize exactly where a sound is coming from, you can better survive and avoid getting eaten. But also for the predators, it's actually really useful in order to localize a prey item. So for example, the barn owl in almost complete darkness is able to localize where a small mouse is. And then it's also extremely useful, especially in the case of birds, uh, for example, for interspecies communication. Uh, just like it's important for you all to be able to hear me in order to understand what I'm saying now. And so because hearing is so important, we first have to go over how these reptiles are hearing before we can move into model development. So first I'll show you kind of a rough schematic of what the ear of a bird looks like. And so the ear contains three major sections. You have the external ear, which doesn't present as much of anything within reptiles. It's usually just an opening. You have the middle ear system that will contain, uh, for all reptiles, just a single middle ear bone. You have the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And then you also have the series of windows that provide openings to the inner ear. And then the inner ear itself is this larger uh, kind of labyrinth that is in purple and green here. And what's really important about the inner ear is it contains, it has the cochlear duct that holds this thin membrane. And this membrane is, is ciliated and it, uh, the inner ear itself is filled with a fluid. And so as the movements propagate through this fluid of the ear, it moves the cilia 
And that is actually transferred uh, through the eighth nerve and sent as a signal that we can then process as sound in the brain. And so both the middle ear and inner ear are really crucial in allowing hearing ability. And that's because the middle ear serves as what's called an impedance matcher. And so the middle ear is filled with air, whereas that inner ear is filled with a fluid. And so impedance is just the wanting uh, of a substance to reflect energy or to reflect sound in this case. And so because you go from air to a more dense fluid, the inner ear really wants to reflect a lot of that sound. And so the middle ear actually allows for an increase of force and pressure uh, at the oval window where that middle ear bone sits. And so it increases the amount of pressure and helps the fluid within the ear flow, which means you'll actually have a better signal that you can pick up on the basilar membrane. So as you can see, the middle ear serves a really important and, and crucial purpose in terms of hearing. And because of that, with these new proxies uh, that I went on to develop, I wanted to incorporate middle and inner ear morphology and see how that affects our predictions of hearing in extinct reptiles. So the current models actually just use the length of the basilar membrane and cochlear duct length. So they don't account for um, any middle ear morph morphometric. And so that's what I did. And I also went on to use phylogenetic comparative methods, which take into account the relationships of species as well in model development. So in, in order to collect data, of course, those uh, soft tissues that I pointed out previously in the other slide, they don't preserve, right? But you do have x-ray computed tomography that you can use to fill in digitally, kind of recreate these open spaces. And so the inner ear actually in a fossil will be an opening within the skull that you can then actually recreate after you get a, a CT scan. So I collected that for 56 different reptile species and I went on to isolate and form the inner ear labyrinths and then the pressure relief system of the ear as well as the oval window where the actual middle ear bone sits. And so these images were then taken of these 3D models and they were measured. And then the auditory data was actually collected from the literature. And so if you look at C here, that is an audiogram. And we, what this shows on the x-axis is the frequency of a sound that is played. And then on the y-axis, you have the threshold or how loud in decibels the sound has to be in order for it to be processed and picked up by the species. And so using both of these data types, as well as a phylogeny of the species showing their relationships, I was able to develop models. But first, I did a little bit of exploration of the data. I wanted to see the impact of the middle ear measurements that I took on hearing. And by hearing here, I meant uh, hearing range, maximum frequency, minimum frequency, as well as the frequency that is best heard. So this is the frequency at which it could be as low as possible and the animal will still have a response. And so what I found when looking at the presence of a pressure relief window and how this affects hearing, uh, we generally found that those species that did have a pressure relief system had larger hearing ranges. They also could hear higher maximum frequencies, but we found that their minimum frequencies stayed relatively the same. And so what that was showing is that an expansion of these higher frequency sounds is what is leading to these larger hearing ranges where you can hear a wider variety of frequencies. And so this pressure relief system is present within all of aves and crocodilia, and it's present within some lepidosaurs, but not within turtles and tortoises. And so though this is not the only way that pressure relief can take place, this is one of the predominant ways. But this system did evolve independently among all of these groups. And so I'll continue to refer to it as the pressure relief window to avert, avoid some of the most more um, clade specific terms for this mechanism. So more into data exploration, I also wanted to explore how different clades within reptiles compared to one another in terms of their hearing abilities and came out to find that aves had a larger hearing range 
uh, compared to crocodiles and lepidosaurs, but also that they, of course, had this higher maximum frequency limit of their hearing, as well as higher best frequencies. So the best frequency that a bird can hear is very typically around 2000 Hertz, whereas for both crocodiles and lepidosaurs, this was shifted much lower in comparison. So knowing that, and that there's also these independent origins of the uh, pressure relief mechanism, I wanted to look specifically uh, at AVs and use that AVs regression, if found, uh, to predict hearing in a sample of extinct reptiles. And so what I did happen to find using PGLS regressions, like I mentioned, that account for the relationships among taxa, we find that both middle and inner ear measures serve as significant predictors of hearing. And so here you can see relationships between the area of the pressure relief window against the area of the oval window where the columella sits. And we can see that there are a positive relationship between that ratio and hearing range and negative relationships between minimum frequency and the best hearing frequency. And so these models actually ended up demonstrating higher R squared values than uh, some of the previous models that were developed. And so that means we might have a little bit more predictive power uh, in terms of predicting hearing range, but they were still kind of restricted to below an R squared of about 0 0.7. Uh, so it's still on the lower side, but performs a little bit better than some of the other models previously predicted. And we found that the best serving models were actually the ones that included both middle ear and inner ear morphology. And so using the best fitting avian models, we went on to look at three taxa, Falcarius utahensis, Tyrannosaurus rex, and Archaeopteryx. And we use these because of the estimated homology um, of that pressure relief system with that of avies. So we could get the most accurate predictions. And so I then went on to predict these values and compare them to previous models and see how it was affected by the application of middle ear morphometrics. And what it came out to show was actually that the predictions were significantly lower in terms of both hearing range and maximum hearing frequencies that were predicted. And so com comparing to uh, the most recent other study on predicting hearing, Walsh et al., we see significantly lower estimated hearing ranges for all three taxa, with Tyrannosaurus rex actually being very similar to the original predictions. Um, but Archaeopteryx is much you know, closer in size to modern day birds. And so this was kind of interesting to see lower predictions for Archaeopteryx. Um, but then for maximum hearing frequency, we also saw these lower estimations. However, these lower estimations aren't outside of uh, you know, the normal estimates of some modern day birds for Archaeopteryx um, and Tyrannosaurus rex, the new estimations actually pair very well with their predictions of having very low frequency vocalizations. And so it was really interesting to see how the effect, how middle ear morphology might actually be affecting our estimates and what that might mean in the future of predicting hearing in reptiles. So some of the potential limitations are that some of the models that were developed that weren't used in prediction had lower R squared values. And so we don't have as much predictive power for some of those models. We also had to use um, auditory data that was compiled using a method called the cochlear microphonic, which has been debated for use in lepidosaurs, but it is the largest source of data and almost the entirety of the source of data, auditory data for lepidosaurs. So that's something that could be addressed in the future using different methods. And then um, some, of the method, some of the models we developed also incorporate body masses, which will certainly pose uh, some of an issue as our predictions of body mass in dinosaurs already have an amount of error. So that's an additional error source that would be presented in those models specifically. And so in conclusion, we found that the middle ear morphometrics can be used to predict uh, hearing in extinct reptiles using phylogenetic comparative methods. And those models that incorporate middle ear morphometrics actually are seeming to perform better than inner ear only models. And so hopefully in the future, what we can do is broadly apply these models and predict hearing and see where shifts are occurring in terms of hearing range and maximum frequency within dinosauria.
I think that would be awesome, especially since um, when you look at AVs, you see this much higher hearing range and maximum hearing frequency. It'd be really cool to see where that shift occurs and what that shift might be correlating with in their environment. And so that is all for my talk today. I'd like to give special thanks to Julia and all of my committee members, as well as the entirety of the Clark Lab. And if you have any questions, uh, now would be the perfect time. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jasmine. That was an amazing talk. Love the live captioning. Um, as a reminder to everyone, please vote for the best talk at the Master Saturday link. Um, I'll probably type into the chat there. And now we have a few minutes for questions. I guess we have like, we've run out of time, but we have a type for like a quick question. All right, so we have one from Travis Stone. Is there any evidence that fluid density in the semicircular canals have changed over time? And what effects, if any, this may have had on middle ear morphologies? Yeah, no, that's that's a really interesting question. Unfortunately, I, I don't think there is a way that through the fossil record you would be able to estimate the density of the fluid that was within, uh, just because the only preservation we have is pretty much the outside surface um, of the actual inner ear. But that, that's a great question. I, I wish there was some way to uh, study that. And then now we have one more question from Will Reyes. Could you apply this method to estimate hearing on non crocodilomorph suicidians, or is data so limited? Um, I, I would say that d probably data is still limited uh, as, as term in because the regressions that I'm using now that are really successful are for kind of the closest clades leading up to AVs. It might still be in the air. It, it's, it's likely that we still need work on developing these models to have really accurate predictions. It could get you a ball range, you know, a ballpark, general ballpark of hearing, but uh, nothing too specific at the moment. Well, great. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming to our session today. Again, please vote for the best talk um, after the session is over.